Hi everyone, welcome to the eighth installment of the Writer Access Writer Webinar Series. I'm the host, Greg Hunt, the Talent Marketing Manager here at Writer Access, and this month we'll be discussing freelance writing tips for niche industries. Uh, if you tuned in last month for the Writer Webinar, you probably know what the format is like and we're doing something similar. I'll be chatting with some six-star Writer Access writers about how to get started writing for niche industries, as well as their experience in specific areas and some general tips and, and thoughts. Um, before we begin, note that this webinar is being recorded. So if you look out for an email tomorrow, you should receive recordings and slides if you're registered. Um, those are definitely, you can download those, you can share them with your friends. Um, the topic, or I'm sorry, the format of this webinar is going to be three short presentations with a few brief questions immediately afterwards and then a longer Q&A session at the end with all three presenters at the same time. Um, during the presentation, feel free to, I definitely encourage you to chat in your questions or thoughts so I can share them with the presenters and have them talk about them more. You can also, you can send those through the chat box here in GoToWebinar, it's in the dashboard, or you can tweet them. We'll be live tweeting this event with the hashtag right on. So, as I mentioned, I'm the host. Talent Marketing Manager here at Writer Access, Greg Hunt. Uh, you can tweet me or you can tweet Writer Access. Um, and the experts this month will be, first of all, we have Lisa W., who is going to be talking to us about what it means to work in a niche industry, how to go about finding that industry, and she'll talk a little bit about her experience in niche industries. Uh, specifically, we'll also have Darla S., will be giving us some tips about developing your unique niche, and Lynn H. will be discussing her decade and a half um, writing for the medical industry. So I'm really excited for those. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's a freelance writer for two years here at Writer Access, and she's been working with private clients, and um, she is an expert in niche freelance writing. So welcome, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. We can't hear you. Thanks, Fred. You're... Am I, there you am are. I muted now? <laughs> there you are. Okay. Thank you. I'm, well, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be participating. And I'm a little verklempt, as Mike Myers used to say, from the pollen here in North Carolina. So <laughs> I apologize if I cough or if my voice is a little scratchy. Okay, so uh, next slide. Please. Here we go. In the traditional job market, workers market themselves in a huge variety of ways. Some position themselves as specialists in certain fields or within subsets of a field, while others build themselves as a jack or jill of all trades, and they have a wide skill set and broad expertise. Hiring managers know, though, it's really rare to find both in the same employee. It does happen. But while the generalist is more adaptable and can accept a wide range of jobs, the specialist will be more in demand and command a higher salary. The hiring manager's generalist really can be a dime a dozen, unfortunately. And next slide. The world of freelancing is really no different than traditional jobs in that regard. As a freelancer, it's likely that you've written on dozens or even hundreds of different topics, and you may not want to limit yourself to just one or two, the problem is that there's much more competition among generalists. If you can find a specialty niche and make it your own, you're much more likely to encounter greater demand along with clients who are willing to pay a higher price. And that slide just shows some of the um, aspects of the speech. Okay, so how do you find, sorry about that, yeah, you can go to the next one. How do you find a niche in freelancing? Let's take a look at writer access and how you can identify an area of specialty <coughs> pardon me, that will work for your unique skills and knowledge. We'll also talk about maintaining and increasing your expertise in your chosen niche, and I'll give you an example within my own background. First, let's talk about how you can identify a niche. These tips refer specifically to writer access, but the general concepts work in the greater universe of freelancing as well. Okay, next slide. If you're writing for writer access, you know that casting calls are a significant method for clients to find new writers. Clients post a casting call, writers respond, 
and clients can send a solo order to a single writer or create a love list of multiple writers. As you review and apply to casting calls, make note of the topics. I notice lots of orders relating to medical services along with home improvement and technology. Depending on your writer level and the casting calls you're reviewing, you may notice that other topics are prevalent as well. In addition, review what's available in the open orders. What topics are clients looking for? Are they asking for a certain style of writing, like humor or business formal? You don't have to limit your niche to a certain topic area. It can also be a style or format, like blog posts, ebooks, white papers, or business letters. And next slide. After you've identified some topic styles and formats that show up repeatedly, think about your personal experience. Have you had education or jobs that line up with the demand you're observing? For instance, if you've worked as a fitness instructor or taught aerobics, that might actually be something to mention when you're going after wellness-related assignments. And I actually did that for a couple summers during college. That's another story. But think about your work experience, but also consider other areas of your life. Your major in college is relevant, even if you haven't worked in that field. Do you have any volunteer experience that might relate to a possible area of specialty in your freelancing? What about your own personal hobbies and areas of interest? Having personal experience in an area is very different than simply searching for information. <clears throat> I write about HVAC and other home improvement topics from time to time, but I have no doubt that I could serve clients better if I had real-world experience in those areas. Searching for information on how an air conditioning system works is really quite different than having taken one apart, I would imagine, since I've never done that. Based on your research through casting calls, open orders, and your accounting of your own areas of expertise, choose one or a few areas in which you have unique experience and a viewpoint to offer clients. <coughs> Pardon me. And next slide. Once you've identified your niche, how can you build and increase your expertise in that area? Well, one way is to read frequently. If you choose to specialize in technology, for example, pick several publications that you'll read regularly to keep abreast of the latest news. Consider conducting some research on your own and compile a list of resources, including websites, that you can refer to for future assignments. You can create a running list of possible topics that you can customize for different clients. You also can consider working towards some continuing education or certifications in your field. <coughs> Next slide. Okay. In my case, one of my areas of specialty is senior living. I owned a graphic design and marketing firm for about 14 years that worked with quite a few senior living providers. So I got a lot of experience that way and learned a lot about the industry and individual communities. Then I moved on to a job as vice president of marketing for a large senior living provider in my state. And then I worked as a communications consultant serving senior living communities across the country. I also have several different certifications in the field, and I read regularly um, along with participating in continuing education in order to keep my certifications active. So my background and knowledge serve me really well in the type of projects I complete for clients in the senior living industry through writer access and elsewhere. I write regularly, write blog posts for senior living providers. I've also written ebooks, websites, marketing emails, white papers, and um, lots of other types of projects. And next slide. So just to recap, you can build a successful freelancing career. You definitely can as a generalist. And as we all know, freelancing can be feast or famine. There are times you take what you can get. But by choosing one or several areas that you can specialize, you start to build your expertise and establish a niche that may provide you with ongoing work when other types of work start to dry up a little. Okay. And thank you all very much. That's my presentation. My contact info is there. And please feel free to contact me with any questions or if I can be of assistance. And thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Um, very interesting to hear um, about in general finding your niche and then uh, some of your specific senior living stuff. Um, I definitely have lots of questions. I'm, I'm really curious about the senior living um, 
you mentioned that you had a little experience doing that in college. Um, not at, not in college, but I uh, I had a graphic design firm myself and a business partner, um, and we had various employees as well over the years. And we did that for about 14 years. We didn't really intend to specialize in senior living, but it kind of worked out that way that we got one senior living client, and then it sort of starts to snowball, and you get known in the industry, and then before you know it, you have that you're working for. Interesting. So it kind of found you, and then you, was there a point where you realized, like, oh, maybe this is something I should specialize in. I keep getting these, these yes, clients. There, yeah, yeah, there was, and, and I think it's probably different for everybody, but, but I think there's a point where you reach critical mass, you know, and, and I guess that's another way to, to find a niche on writer access or in your private freelancing that sometimes like you said, a, a specialty can find you, and um, that's one I hadn't really thought of until now, but you can kind of look at the different work you've done, and even if it seems random, there may be a pattern there and something to pursue. Yeah, finding that through line of what your past is and what you want to do now and kind of making that connection, I think that's really interesting. Do you do, I see you're elite in hospitality on writer access, so you do other hospitality-related things as well? Well, the, the hospitality um, elite certification really came mostly from my work with senior living because most of my senior living work, I've, I've done um, some work with skilled nursing and assisted living aspects of senior living and memory care, but my work as a vice president of marketing and as a communications consultant was primarily in independent living for upscale continuing care retirement communities, and there's a very strong hospitality aspect with those. They really position themselves as um, almost like a luxury resort type of place. So there's mm -hmm. an expectation of a very high level of customer service, fine dining, staff who are very well trained, and um, actually I know there's at least one DCRC now that's on a cruise ship. So. You know, I think those <laughs> wow. industries kind of kind of merge together. That's interesting. What's the biggest challenge in writing for your specific niche of senior living? Um, I think it's really, and this is probably true for a lot of niches, is um, not plagiarizing yourself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, coming up with fresh ideas. When, you know, when you've written thirty articles about a community that has a new garden, you know, or, or they have they have the world's greatest activities program, you know, and they all do. So I think it's tr I think it's trying to get to the heart of what really differentiates these communities as as compared to what do they think differentiates the community, and trying to find a balance, and just trying to find a fresh angle, and um, you know, do justice to each client mm -hmm. without. I mean, using your knowledge and expertise from the past, but, but not relying on that so much that you're not being creative and coming up with fresh ideas for each client. Interesting. Do you have a strategy for that, or it's kind of each project is different in, in finding the fresh, interesting angle? I try to approach each one. Well, I, just for an example, I have one client that's an agency that I write for probably seven or eight different senior living communities through them, and I'll get a project from that agency and she'll say, um, this project is basically just like the one you wrote for so and so two months ago. But <laughs> I don't I don't go back and look at what I did for so and so. You know, I try to just start fresh. I don't like go back and find, oh, what sources did I use for that project? I just totally start my research again and pretend it's the first time I ever wrote that article. Interesting. One last thing I, I noticed, you, you mentioned it's important to stay up to date in the industry news. I think that's definitely a good way to, you know, stay fresh in your niche and make sure you're um, sort of at the peak of what's going on. But how, how do you do that? Do you subscribe to magazines or what's, you, what's your way of staying fresh in your industry? Well, pretty much everything is, um, you know, is online now. So mm -hmm. I, I tend to use news feeds, like a, I use Feedly, which is a news reader, just because that's easiest for me, so I don't have to go to 40 different websites every month. 
Um, so I just find sources that I think are going to be good ongoing sources and subscribe to them in my Feedly and just have, you know, I have a, a section for senior living and I have one for technology and if you have any other niche you can do the same thing. And another way to do it that I've done frequently in my career is to set up a Google alert. You know, you mm -hmm. don't want to be too broad because like if I do a Google alert just for senior living, I'm going to get bombarded. But if there's more of a, you know, more of a specialty within that, like maybe if I know I'm going to be writing about memory care, I, you know, I might want to set an alert for that just to see what the latest is. Um, and also searching research, going to Google Scholar um, and looking at what studies have been done in the past year just to see if there's a fresh perspective, you know, I can give my writing. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I think that's a really important aspect of it. Instead of having a little bit of time to research and make sure you are staying fresh and you're an expert in that industry, will you know obviously strengthen your ability to work in that niche. Um, thanks so much, Lisa. Really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. We will talk to you a little more at the end. Everyone, if they have questions for Lisa, make sure you chat them in so we can get them to her and hear what she has to say. Um, moving on, we're going to talk next with Darla S. Darla is a full-time freelance writer, blogger, award-winning author, six-star writer here on the platform. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to her and welcome Darla. Uh, tell us all about your niche writing. Hi. Um, okay. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about developing your own niche because um, you can deal with, as Lisa said, you can deal with mainstream niches and you'll find a lot of work in those areas. These are industries that like um, companies like Writers Access will ask you to identify as your specialty. Um, you choose them because you've written about them for years, you have an academic background in that field, or you have a vocational experience in that field. Um, I found myself in a unique position um, about six months ago. I wanted to, I've been an artist most of my life. I wanted to start promoting myself more as an artist. And so I, I was running two businesses, basically. I had an art business and I had a writing business. And I wanted to find a way to kind of merge the two. So, but when I started looking for commercial jobs in art, with art blogging, they just really weren't there. So you can go to the next slide. I found myself uh, having to kind of develop something beyond the mainstream. I've listed some mainstream um, niches that, that people usually, freelance writers usually encounter. Healthcare, legal, marketing, finance, fashion. When I write on, on WA, I generally write medical topics, healthcare topics, because that's where my education is and my, my background. If I were to go on WA and look for art topics, they just really wouldn't be there. You might find something in graphic design, you might find something in web design, but not the kind of art that I wanted to cover. Go to the next slide. So I, I found uh, there was a difference between specialty and niche. I wanted to develop my own niche uh, um, regarding something that I've been passionate about. When you're creating your own niche, it really benefits you to pick something that you're excited about because it's going to take a lot of work. So uh, you love food, you love to create recipes, you're a foodie, you like to travel. These are, are less common mainstream specialties. You might find some work in them, but uh, it's, it's more difficult. More than likely what you're going to end up doing is building up your name in that industry so that you're the one people come looking for when they want a writer. Next slide. Uh, when you, the problem is when you, when you focus on something that you're really passionate about, you may end up going a little outside the box, which is what I, which is where I found myself at. Um, art writing, like I said, it's just not really a commercial, commercially sought after industry, and you know, I wanted to be able to create that industry, create that niche for myself so that when somebody wanted an art blogger, they would look specifically for me, sort of build my own brand in that field. 
it's not it's not something it's something that I probably would have to to the current clients on mostly. Or I've actually convinced at least one broker site that art might be something they wanted to look into uh, marketing wise. So um, I've listed some of the kind of crazy uh, non-specific niches that you might come across. Next slide. When you're building your own niche, you've got to think outside of platforms like WA. You have to think about your own marketing strategy. Uh, and that's going to start with a blog. Uh, it's still, it's possible to create a niche that will become in demand. But you're not really building the industry, you're building your name in the industry. So your the idea is to not um, look for commercially available topics, but to kind of build your own. And that's going to start always, almost always with a blog. It's up to you to create that market with your blog. Next slide. What blogging does, I, I put blogger at the top because that's what I use. Um, what blogging does is it just, uh, it allows you to kind of get your name out there there's a, a term that marketing people use all the time, influencer. That's what you're looking to be. You want to be an influencer in um, in the industry that you've chosen, even if it's off the wall. Anybody, well, I'm not going to say anybody, but a lot of people can write about healthcare. A lot of people can write about um, marketing in general, or you know, any. It doesn't take a lot of ex, a lot of work to find jobs in those fields. It does take a lot of work to build your own niche, so it's possible, but you would have to do it yourself. Um, the little heading here, that's the top of my blog. When I started creating my blog, I did some research to see what other art blogs looked like. What I found was a tremendous amount of redundancy. Um, they all covered basically the same thing. They all covered uh, spotlight artists, they all covered gallery events, they all covered uh, exhibitions and art festivals throughout the world. And I wanted to do something different. That was that was how I was creating my niche. That was how I was going to make myself stand out. There's a lot of uh, marketing bloggers out there, but there's only a few names that really pop in people's minds when they think marketing influencer. I wanted to be that kind of influencer, and to do that, I was going to have to take a different approach. Uh, that's why my heading says art and artistic endeavors. Uh, I'm the kind of person that tends to be really curious about just about everything, and I'm especially curious about art and the different kind of arts, artwork people do. So I focus my blog not so much on what on my own personal artwork but on um, unique art that I see around the world. And if you read my blog, you'll see that. There's a, there's a, uh, a feature that I do co called uh, Cool Art Minute that just covers just really off the wall. I, I covered a guy who does his, all, all his artwork in cardboard, that kind of thing. Um, I covered a woman who does all her painting on lips. Um, I wanted, that's how I made myself stand out in this field. It's not perfect. I've only really been doing it for a couple of months, but uh, my readers have doubled and tripled, I would say, over, since I started, maybe six months ago, and I am starting to get some commercial interest as an art blogger. Next slide. Uh, I, the way that I'm doing that is, it starts with my blog. I have some tips here for, for making that work for you if you're interested in developing your own niche. Um, it really starts with blogging consistently. If you let, you know, uh, blogs that are inactive die, uh, people forget about them. It's, they're kind of a, the internet audience is very simple. And if you don't keep your blog active, it's going to die. So blog several times a week. I try to blog three or four times a week, at least. I would say on average, most weeks it's more like five or six. Stay focused, kind of. Now, the, the reason I say that is because 
I write an art blog, I call it an art blog, I talk about art, but I talk about a lot of things that don't necessarily specific to art. For instance, I've covered, I've written stories about Hillary, I've written stories about uh, Bernie, I wrote about Trump, I wrote about uh, Confederate flags, I wrote about um, the Orlando shootings, I took current trending news topics and I turned them around and made them about art. Um, some of the most read blogs that I've done so far had to do with politics. The way I turned it around to make it about art is I spotlighted different um, uh, artists' representations of Hillary or that kind of thing. Every one of my blogs features at least two other artists and uh, some kind of work they do that has to do with that topic. So I write about Barney. I, or, or, Bernie, I, you know, I uh, focus on art for him. Okay, promote your so your niche on social media. You really, you have to you have to market yourself if you're going to go to a niche. Um, a there's a lot of talk about whether you should really promote yourself on Facebook. Uh, my feeling is that if your friends on Facebook are really friends, they can put up with one or two posts you promoting your blog. So. Um, it's also really good to join groups on Facebook. Facebook is, has a lot of art groups and I'm part of them all and every time I write a blog, I promote it, I put the links on those groups. Um, you definitely want to use Twitter um, and LinkedIn and I even do Google+. Plus. But don't be shy on social media is the point. You really have to market yourself. Syndicate your blog to expand your audience. Um, this. This was actually a topic of a webinar that we had a couple months ago about you really have to uh, focus on syndication too when you're doing your own blog. Medium, Pulse, BuzzFeed the big, are the big ones, but look around, there are a lot of them. Network with others in that field, that's kind of the, um, the groups that I was talking about, join Facebook groups and, and start, uh, we talked a lot about reading a lot, you have to really uh, one way to stay on top of current topics in your field is to network with others. Keep it real. What I mean by that is, uh, this is especially important if you're trying to build your own niche. You have to keep it consistent. Um, everything has to have your name on it. Even if it's not your real name, just use the same name. You know, when somebody um, looks up our blog, I want them to see my name. and I want them to see five different names that I might be, you know, keep it keep it consistent and keep it real. Build on it. It starts with the blog. Already I am starting to expand um, my blog and look for marketing possibilities. I'm, going to, I'm approaching galleries in LinkedIn and locally uh, about writing a blog for them. I'm, uh, I'm taking some of the curation that I've done on my blog and I'm powered into a magazine quarterly magazine and online magazine. You, know, you start with the blog, but you build on it. So the more you do ebooks, white papers, and all that kind of stuff, the better. Next, next slide. Okay, and that's all I have. Uh, my website, that is the blog if you're interested in reading it. Um, the Sachi Art, that's, that's just my gallery. My blog is ultimately about promoting my artwork and my name. But um, I do do a trend to do other stuff with it. And my Twitter and my uh, WA profile. That's all, all I All right. But thanks so much, Darla. I appreciate it. So no I, you want people, so the website, that's actually your blog, correct? The gallery is your art? Yeah, that's my art. Yeah. That's one of the galleries that represents me now. Okay. What kind of art do you do? Uh, mostly right now I do digital painting. I've done all kinds of art, but right now I'm kind of focused on digital painting. And that's part of it, too, because digital painting is sort of a new thing. So Very interesting. It's a, it's a growing and emerging field in art. So. Do you find that the writing about your niche of art, does that enhance your making of your art? Does it, does it kind of feed back into it in an interesting way? 
Um, I would I would say the other way around. I would say that the art I create tends to feed into the blog. Like um, I tend to when I when I create art, I tend to pick subjects that matter to me, and those usually translate into a blog post. Interesting. Sense, so you mentioned during your your talk that um, you said hopefully. Somebody, the person is passionate about their niche. Um, how important do you think it is that somebody is passionate about the niche they choose? You think, you know, like... I think if you're going to build your own niche, if you're looking to work in an industry that's not quite as mainstream, I think you need to be passionate about it because otherwise you'll lose interest in it. And you're playing the long game here. You're not, you're not looking for something that's going to last a month. You're building, you're building your name and it could take years to actually get there. So if you're not interested in what you're doing, then you just waste your time. Yeah, it also seems like uh, you said you're doing blogging three or four times a week, so you have to be um, kind of committed to doing that work that's not necessarily for a client, and you're not necessarily getting paid for it, but you're sort of doing it to build toward developing your niche and, and your expertise in that industry. Is that, is that true, you think? That, that's exactly right, and you know, now I'm already to the point after, I've, I've tried to do a couple different strategies with my blog, but the one that I have now is the one that I think is working most, the best, and I've only been doing it for a couple of months, but I already you know, have enough material that I can approach local galleries um, to do marketing, art marketing for them. I already have enough that I can approach online venues. Uh, like Art Square and stuff like that, to do guest blogs. So after oh, only a couple of months, I already have room building on it. That's really interesting, very interesting. I also like how you mentioned to connect your niche into sort of trending topics or things that you wouldn't think of being related to art or whatever you might do um, as a way of kind of pulling in more of a mainstream audience and getting more eyes on it and getting more attention. I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, and that's not something that other art blogs do either. I've noticed uh, surprisingly. I don't know why they don't do it, but I've noticed that they don't do it. But if you look at uh, influencers in the marketing field and marketing bloggers, you'll see a lot of them do that. We'll pull current topics and make them about marketing. Yeah. So you're bringing kind of your marketing knowledge to your niche writing knowledge. That's an interesting kind of mixing of worlds there. Well, they're all they're all really connected. I mean, my my ultimate goal is to market art and market myself as an as an art expert, and that's going to include writing. Yeah, very cool. Um, I noticed that you mentioned the Kardashians twice in your uh, presentation. <laughs> Are you a fan? Oh. No, I'm not, and, and, <laughs> and that's why I mentioned them twice. <laughs> I think it's kind of a a sad testament on our, our uh, society. <laughs> so you can't mention all If you love the Kardashian, uh, God bless you, you know? <laughs> Good for you. And hopefully there's no lost Kardashian sister or whatever that was you had on there. Let's hope that doesn't Poor Rob. Soon. Never got his own reality show. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, Darla. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to tell us about your art niche. I think that's really interesting. And again, if anyone has questions, Specific to that, or even more general, Darla talked a lot about blogging and setting up a blog for the niche. So I think there's a lot of avenues that people might be interested in exploring there. So definitely let us know. Thanks, Darla. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Lynn H. Lynn is a medical writer. She's been doing this for the last 15 years. Six-star writer here at Writer Access. Um, so. You know, I, I want to jump right in. Lynn, welcome. Hello. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for getting on with us. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Tell us all about writing for the medical field. All right. Well, finding a niche was easy for me. I worked in medicine for 20 years before becoming a medical writer. My experience in hospitals, laboratories, universities, and doctor's offices gave me deep knowledge of medical terms and procedures. Working with patients honed my communication skills and fueled my dedication to helping people live long and healthy lives. I also have a long history in computer technology. 
I got my first computer in 1983 and was on the internet way back when they still called it the bulletin board system. I taught myself how to use this technology to create websites and more. Somewhere along the line, I met a technology tycoon who asked me to write a technical manual for his company. He liked my work so much, he hired me as an editor-in-chief and head writer of one of the first online newsletters. He even hired a professional educator to act as my private writing tutor. While my roots are in technology, medicine is my first love. So I broke from the newsletter and I started a new career in medical writing. This was before the days of content management companies, so I found most of my early clients on Craigslist. As many freelancers know, finding and managing private clients is really time consuming. So I was glad when companies like Writer Access stepped in to uh, manage those tasks for me. Now I focus all my energy on creating content for medical professionals. So why would a doctor or another medical professional hire a writer like me instead of just writing it themselves? Well, for many reasons. Perhaps the biggest reason is that medical professionals are extremely busy. The average doctor sees about four patients an hour and works about 51 hours a week. This means the typical physician sees more than 200 sick, sick people per week. Many doctors make hospital rounds before and after office hours, and some have to be on call a couple of nights a week. This doesn't leave a whole lot of time for writing and marketing. Another reason medical professionals do not write their own stuff is because, well, they may be great lifesavers, but they may be awful writers. Medical writing is my niche, and saving lives is theirs. Good medical content must be medically accurate, of course, but it also has to be well-written and easy to understand. Medical writers are experts at putting complex medical concepts into easy to read terms, whereas doctors may not be so great at it. Medical writers are also good at keeping up with all the newest research and interpreting the results in a meaningful way. Scientists churn out a mountain of research results every single day, and some of these studies are better quality than our others. A good medical writer knows the difference between solid research and schlocky science and can present the information in a way that the average Joe can understand. Medical writers also know how to do stuff doctors don't. Well, while doctors know how to diagnose injuries and illnesses and treat these things, perform surgery and do other wonderful things, medical writers know how to do things doctors don't. They know how to create brochures and videos and webinars and promotional literature, for example. They also know how to create journal manuscripts, abstracts, pamphlets, training manuals, packets, inserts, and even text messaging campaigns. I learned how to write all of these things by looking at the examples around me and by reading about them on the internet. Medical writers also understand how Google searches work, and they can create content that performs well on Google. A solid understanding of search engine optimization is important for every writer, particularly those in the medical writing niche. I learned how to do proper medical SEO through my work as a webmaster, but anyone can learn how to create content that ranks well on Google search results by reading up on the internet. Professional medical writers also know how to create content that adheres to strict FDA and other regulatory standards. Medical writer must know how to when to say a particular drug or treatment cures a disease, for example, or when she should say that a particular therapy merely supports good health. One of the toughest jobs as a medical writer is explaining to people what I do for a living. I start by explaining that I work for a huge variety of medical professionals like doctors and surgeons and dentists and chiropractors and physical therapists. I write for researchers, hospitals, and nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. I've also worked for medical equipment manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, uh, universities, and government institutions. Oh, let's see here. Uh, many people don't really understand what I do for a living. Most ask me if I wrote the Viagra warning. Uh, 
I tell people that I write things like white papers and research papers, blogs, press releases, patient uh, education websites, and even the pamphlets that they see in a doctor's office and more. Oh, next slide, please. And, and I know what you're thinking. Lynn, isn't that practicing medicine without a license? Well, here's the deal on that. Medical writers do not practice medicine as defined by law. Every state has a slightly different definition of practicing medicine, but most agree that somebody's practicing medicine when he tries to diagnose or cure an injury or illness, prescribes medicine, performs surgery, or claims that he's a doctor. A decent medical writer does none of those things. And in fact, everything that a medical writer writes is first and approved by the medical professional that hires them before it ever hits, hits the print. Um, there's a lot of benefits in, in being a medical writer, a freelance medical writer. I can choose my own projects, set my own schedule, and work at my own pace. I can also work in my pajamas, although I prefer to call it a dual purpose uniform. And medical professionals also benefit from writers who serve in the niche of medical writing. Um, one of the benefits is that it frees doctors and other medical professionals from the time-consuming task of writing. Assigning content creation tasks to writers like me gives medical professionals more time to provide care for patients. Another benefit is that medical writers help professionals stay up on current scientific events specific to their specialty. This helps medical professionals establish themselves as thought leaders in that specialty to use a popular phrase these days. Hiring a medical writer allows medical professionals to present themselves and their companies in the very best light possible by creating content that is relevant and error-free. Finally, hiring a medical writer helps medical professionals provide meaningful and helpful information that patients can really use. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. That was some really good advice. A great overview of the medical writing world. Um, everyone should check out Lynn's website, Twitter, she's got Google Plus, and then, of course, the Writer Access Public Profile. Um, thanks again. Uh, a lot going on there. The medical world covers a big umbrella, it seems like. Um, do you specialize in a specific medical niche? Like within it, is there a sort of subset of things that you do within medicine, or do you kind of cover the whole category? I cover everything. I even cover veterinary medicine um, and medical equipment and um, research and science having to do with it. I, I do everything in medicine. Wow. So you have a background in medicine, but how do you stay up to date on the, the current, the newest, Things. Is it like Lisa does with uh, following things on the internet and Google Alerts and different kinds of news feeds? Or what's your strategy? Well, I'm I am a news and social media hound. I am <laughs> I've got several different Twitter accounts that I follow, like Two Minute Medicine and the CDC and the World Health Organization, and you know it just. Everybody medical that you can that you could know, but along with a lot of the um, leaders in their specialties. I also hit a lot of the like medical news websites, of which there's dozens and dozens of them. I, I usually check them every day, along with Google Plus. Uh, so you do this independent of actual client orders. You just you're just keeping up with the latest thought and, and new ideas just to be on the edge. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very good. I think that's that's important for any industry. Um, I wonder, Darla spoke a lot about using blogging to get herself into the, the art niche, um, which is a slightly a smaller, slightly different world. But and, and for medicine, it seems like you know there aren't a lot of medical bloggers, or maybe there are, but I, I don't think of bloggers as people having their own blogs writing about medicine. Does that exist? 
And if not, what is kind of the entryway into the world of medical writing? Well, most doctor websites will have a blog section where they're, you know, they, they, they uh, put up blogs, uh, usually written by medical writers, about events that are specific in their field. And as far as writing a uh, personal blog about medicine, actually, I, I don't. <laughs> I do not create my. I do not create my own personal blogs for a website to promote my own business because in many many while I will use my real name if asked, you know, for for writer access, they have a way that writers can use their entire name, and I'm glad to do that. Um, most of my work is done for the client under the client's name. Mm. Well, you're pretty established, so you probably have a, a good group of clients. What do you think a, a new writer who's thinking, you know, I know a good bit about medicine, or maybe I was a nurse, and now I want to start writing, where, where do you think they would go, or what's the strategy for them to get into this world? Uh, definitely start with a content management company like Writer Access. Uh, do a solid profile and make sure that your education and background is clearly stated in that profile and then hit the casting calls hot and heavy each and every day. Mm. Do you have a strategy for casting calls? What, what's your, I don't know if you have any secrets you, you don't want to give away, but I'm sure all the writers would love to hear how you approach that. Actually, I say basically the same thing to each and every client. I say I am one of the one of the top medical writers at Writer Access, and that I have um, nearly 20 years experience as a medical writer, 20 years experience in clinical medicine, and then I point them to my profile. Mm. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> what's the what's the biggest challenge in actually writing medical content? The biggest challenge writing the biggest challenge writing medical content is presenting it in a way that the average Joe can understand and still being medically accurate. Sometimes it gets very hard and and I overcome that by on my word I do a spell check and it does the grammar and it gives you the what is it flesh Kincaid score. And I try to keep everything right about seventh or eighth grade or lower, which can mm. be a trick when you're using really big words. <laughs> Especially the Latin medical jargon. Can <laughs> right. that up pretty quickly, huh? Right. And you would think that that's the hard part, but the medical jargon is the easiest part because you can look it up on the internet. Mm. You know, yeah. you know I, I thought you would answer that question with, I've done a little bit of medical writing in the past, um, nothing like you have, but just doing some work for like doctor sites, um, mm -hmm. some things like that. And for me, the hardest part was always working with the doctors themselves, because they are they're experts in the, the subject. Obviously, very you know very smart people. Also, used to being the smartest person in the room, and they want everything to be exactly how they want it. And maybe they don't understand things like SEO or the tone of a blog as opposed to a medical journal or something like that. Um, so. I always found that navigating that relationship could be a little bit tricky. Have you had any experiences working with medical professionals? Well, that's where my 20 years experience in medicine comes in. I've worked with very closely in all my roles in medicine. I've worked very closely with doctors. So they, they don't phase me at all. You know, I... <laughs> I'm just as pushy as they are, so it's okay. <laughs> I work with doctors very well. Do you have a technique for kind of establishing trust with a client in a niche where maybe the client is the subject expert and they might presume that this outsider couldn't possibly, you know, understand something as complicated as, you know, certain types of surgery or something like that, you know, where you have to establish yourself as a kind of authority to that person. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I always look at what they've already written, and I and I mimic it back right at them, because mm. 
everybody, and so everybody, especially doctors and medical professionals, like themselves. <laughs> and so <laughs> what you do is you go back and you research a little bit, find out what the, where they're from. Almost all doctors have uh, published something in their life. You look to what they have already done, then you mimic their voice which is, after all, what medical writing is. What you always want to do is make sure that your writing sounds like it came out of that doctor's mouth. Mm. I yeah, mean? I think that's probably good advice for a lot of different niches where you're working with um, experts and sort of translating their subject into a more general um, Correct. style for, now, the, for the public. If you're, like, if you're, to, to be specific, if you're, if, if I'm working for a urologist, okay, I'll look back to see whether he asks patients to urinate in the cup or to pee in the cup, okay? <laughs> right? And that's a yeah. very big difference. You, and so what I do is I, with all new clients, I spend considerable time reading about the client, finding out whether they're you know, very conservative in their practice or pretty loose and fast and easy with their terms. And I try to mimic those. And that usually wins the doctor over. Yeah, so it's about finding the right tone, the right diction, matching yeah. what that person would do on their own. That's interesting. Correct. Correct. Very cool. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, very interesting stuff about medical writing and good writing advice in general. Um, I want to open it back up to everybody now, all three people. We have Darla, Lisa, and Lynn back on the line. And so some people have been sending in some questions, but keep them coming for the moment. Uh, I'd like to pass them out or throw them out to the crowd and see if anybody is interested or has a specific answer to them. Um, a general question we got was just how do you go about showcasing your expertise to clients? You can talk about that specifically on writer access and then maybe in a more general way off the platform. But um, does anyone have, what, what's your strategy for, for really showcasing your niche skills? Lisa, why don't, can, you, can you speak to that one? Well, I think, as, as Lynn mentioned, um, your profile is very important. You know, you really have to um, speak to your experience and not just your experience, but what can you do for the client? I think it's, um, you know, it's the old, like in sales, you want to talk about benefits and not just features, you know. <laughs> so um, how can you actually help a client? And then I think casting calls are really your chance to shine and to customize. You know, the way I do casting call applications, I have a, a template that I use, but I customize for each client and really try to speak to specifically what they're asking for. Um, and I'll give you an example. I just recently uh, finished a project writing a website for a hospice provider. And in the casting call, I talked about the specific experience I have with hospice, which included when I worked as a newspaper reporter for a number of years, um, I covered health and human services. And I worked very closely with hospice providers, wrote a lot about them, and learned a lot about them. And also my grandfather, before he passed away, had hospice care. So I mentioned that as well and, um, and just talked about what it, what it meant to me personally and that I felt that I could capture their voice because I have experience with, with organizations like them. Mm. Interesting. Anyone else have, have recommendations? for how to you know, get your expertise across? How do you, in your profile or outside that, how do you let people know that you're the expert? Examples, providing plenty of examples. Um, uh, I understand my counterparts there each have, or at least one, each have blogs. Those serve as excellent examples of your writing style and expertise, and also on writer access, providing some nice samples in each of the areas that you write in. I think that it's specifically in medical. Um, yeah. I'm a medical writer as well, and I think they really look at the samples to see, to look for tone, to look for expertise. I agree. Mm -hmm. 
definitely. So another thing I think people are really interested in is just, well, I'm interested in, you guys, you're all experts, you have your niche. How much do you also do more general things? And how do those, you know, do you do 50% of your time toward your niche and then another 50% you're working in marketing? Or what's kind of the breakdown there and how do you see those as interacting and balancing in your writing career? Well, for me, I think it's a very different thing because my my two worlds are really separate at this point. Um, my my freelance writing life and my art life are two different things. My blogging is part of the art life right now. I'm hoping to mesh them two. But on WA, I write primarily health topics and marketing because mm-hmm. that's my field. You know, that's where my if you look at my profile, that's where my education is and that's where my vocational experience is. And so yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah, I'll do I'll do about ninety to ninety five percent medical writing, and then the remainder would be uh, uh, content marketing and SEO. Hmm. There's a lot of general work too. A lot of you know, stuff that just pops up out of nowhere. Like I got a solo recently about vacations, you know. If you look at my profile, I don't know anything about vacations. <laughs> so I don't take them, that's for sure. So. so I have some questions here um, for specific people. Uh, Lisa, uh, somebody's asking where you got your certification. Do you have certification? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, minor for things living. Um, where I got them? Yeah, um, tell us one, about you, your certification, how that works. Okay, one is called uh, Certified Aging Services Professional, and that was given through the University of North Texas for a while that actually changed over to Leading Age, which is the, um, is the industry group for senior living communities. And I got that when I was working as the Vice President of Marketing. I was fortunate enough that my um, company paid for me to go through that, and it involved a about a six-month course of study, and then I actually went to um, an on-site training that lasted for a week, and then there was a test that you had to take to yeah. um, to qualify for that. And then I have another one that's called Certified Marketing Professional, and that one is through Leading Age Illinois. Um, and I went there and also did a course and, and took a test, and I have to renew that one each year. And, send in documentation of the continuing education that I've done each year. So do you find that really useful to have this um, certification that helps you in your niche? Like, you, does that make you stand out in what you do? So I think there are a lot of things that, as the other writers have said, there are so many different things that can make you stand out. And I think it's really a complete picture that you present. If I didn't have those certifications, I would still be writing and senior living, and I think I'd still be doing all the same work that I'm doing. But I think it gives me just a little tiny extra bit of credibility, maybe. And I certainly got some valuable information through those, and probably more importantly were the contacts that I made through participating in those. And a lot of those people I'm still linked with, and certainly if I was looking for additional freelancing clients, I would. those are the people I would turn to who are people in the industry. Interesting. So I have a question for Darla about, about she mentioned that she syndicates her blog. Um, someone want to know what was involved in that and you know how that, how that worked? It's surprisingly simple. You cut and paste and go to the site and, and <laughs> that's all. I, you don't have to go through like any application process. Um, you just mm. repeat, just cut and paste your blog into the right site. Oh, okay. Interesting. What site is that? Do you know? I use Medium, Pulse. Um, I used to use BuzzFeed. They use, they're a little tricky about you doing any commercial. Like since my, my blog shows promo- art that's for sale, they ended up uh, telling me I could do it anymore. But uh, if you're just writing a personal blog and you're not selling any ads or anything, they'll probably let you use BuzzFeed too. So Medium, Pulse, BuzzFeed. Cool. Very cool. Um, and then just one last question here I'm going to ask 
Uh, Lynn, we're going a little bit long, so we'll end it there. Um, Lynn, a writer was asking that if they have experience uh, with, with health healthcare law and FDA regulation, um, if there's work in the medical field for them, do you think, do you see uh, work like that going around? Is that something you would suggest a writer explore? Oh, heck yeah. That's, uh, gee, I'm jealous. <laughs> that, is, that is really, that's a really good skill to have right now. Um, Oh, what is the Obama just passed a, or the FDA just passed a legislation not long ago, uh, the FDA Plain Writing Act, and understanding FDA law and, and regulations about writing and writing in, in plain English is monumentally helpful. All right, well, good to hear. I'm sure that writer will be happy. Maybe some other people can... Look into that themselves. It sounds like a growing industry with you know always more regulation and all that. Well, Very cool. Yeah, well, I want to thank all three of you again, Darla, Lisa, Lynn. Um, great job. Really enjoyed having you on here to talk about your specific niche and how you've grown your career. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, you can reach out to us at Writer Access. You can call our number, Craig at Writer Access. You can email me. And check in again next month for another writer webinar. All right. Bye, everyone.